Hello, my name is Carl Lloyd Hauser. I am the senior pastor of Grace Community Church, and I am so excited that you are with us on this podcast. We also want you to get connected in a church family. If you don't have a local church, check us out at gracemontrose.org. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to grow and connect with God. But we pray that these next 25, 30 minutes that you spend with us are powerful, that God meets you and speaks to you because he loves you so much. Hey, hi. Thank you very much. It's very kind. Yeah, they did let me go from the intern program. Uh, it, was, it wasn't working out anymore, but got hired on the outreach position, so that's good. I'm pretty excited about that, um, you know, the idea being that there's a, a good foundation that's been laid, and I don't know how many of us realize, but there is a, there's a huge field that's ready to be harvested just outside of our doors here in Montrose in the trailer park communities and the campgrounds and uh, there's a lot of people that have never never heard the gospel of Christ within miles of us so I'm pretty excited about that and there'll be opportunity to be involved in that it should be really good uh, but we're on the uh, deep clean series I would also call it the reality check series um, kind of taking a look inside and seeing what we can what we can change what we can keep the same I'm going to be talking a little bit about patterns and consequences this week, um, stuff in our life that's worked, stuff in our life that's led us to where we want to be, and on the other side of that, stuff that is probably, if we were to go back, we would maybe change a little bit of it and say, I'm not quite sure. And I have a, a similar story to that. Um, when Tracy and I were first married, uh, we moved into this little tiny farmhouse. It was the quaint, quintessential out in the middle of a field, a postage stamp lawn, a little white picket fence, the whole deal. And uh, I thought, man, this will be great. What a, a fun place to live for your first house. And carried her across the threshold, had a nice dinner, and uh, got all of our stuff moved in. And in the middle of the night, one night, um, we're just laying there peacefully sleeping, and uh, we're awakened by a strange sound. It was really a bizarre sound. And I thought, man, are those cats? Are those cats underneath the house? And Tracy woke up and said, what is that? So I, I think there's, uh, there's maybe a fight going on underneath the house. The house had a brick foundation, and not all of it was intact. And so I figured, oh, it's cats, and they were, happened to be springtime, so you fill in the blanks with what's going on in there. Uh, but it turns out it wasn't cats underneath the house, because uh, I said, I, I told Tracy, I think if we just lay still, everything will be Okay. And it I might not have been even 10 seconds later, Tracy said, oh, I have to use the restroom. <laughs> and so, no sooner did her feet hit the floor than this powerful waft of skunk smell came up through, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. If you've smelled skunks before, you, it's like 3,500 pounds of hot nutmeg just jammed into your face, <laughs> and you cannot get away from it. And so, the whole place, I mean, it was a tiny little house, the whole house smelled of skunks, and so the sweet sounds of skunk procreation go on throughout the springtime, and later on there's like six or seven little baby skunks that we can't seem to get out into the house. And so I went to this store, uh, it's called Ranch and Home, and uh, you know, you wake up in the morning and you think, oh good, it doesn't smell anymore. And I said, oh, Tracy, I'll go get, I'll find out how to get rid of these things, I'll go to Ranch and Home, they know everything, right? So I walk in, it was a Saturday morning, it was pretty busy there, and I noticed that the crowds sort of part as I walk by. <laughs> and I, something's wrong with this. And I went and talked to this gal that worked there, and she took a step back, and I said, I, I smell like skunks, don't I? And she said, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. We've had comments. <laughs> so anyway, the point being, it didn't go the way we had hoped it would go, and I still stunk like it. It wasn't that it was just a one-time thing. I was still smelling like the skunks that I didn't want to smell like anymore, right? And the point is that uh, there's things in our life that just seem to never go away. It seems to affect us for longer than we want it to. And the reason is that we've developed this pattern that conditions us to live a certain way or allows us to behave a certain way. And that's what people see. And that's, that's the smell that we put off because of the patterns that we've involved our life in. And some of them are good. I mean, there's financially good patterns. There's, there's good patterns in your walk with Christ. But there's also these patterns that are destructive, and they're based in selfish nature. One that comes to mind for me was, uh, years ago I worked at a, a youth group when I was 17 or 18, I don't remember, but there was this gal there named Hillary, and I always thought I was just a fun-loving person who liked to laugh with people, right? 
I didn't really realize what I was doing, but this gal Hillary came up to me and said, Jeremy, do you realize in the three years that I've known you, you have never said anything nice to me? I thought, oh my goodness, that can't be true. And she says, no, I'm not kidding. You have never said anything nice to me. And so I apologized, of course, and the first thought in my head was, man, i got to change. There's something in my life, there's a pattern that I've started that has to change. I cannot keep living my life this way. And I don't want to affect people that way. I don't want to be known for something like that. So there's a version of me that was potentially going to exist had Hillary not said something to me. And it's been, honestly, once somebody says something like that to you, and you realize that there's a time you need to repent, you need to change, you start noticing these kind of things a lot. Like, oh my goodness, I do do that. I do do. <laughs> I do that a lot. <laughs> so you have to evaluate your life. What are the things that I should continue? What are the, what's the stuff that I need to put behind me? What needs to go on to the chopping block? Or am I where I want to be in my relationships? Am I where I want to be in my finances? Or am I, is my family healthy? And these are kind of delicate subjects because I know there's heartbreak in a lot of these areas. And it's not all because we've made terrible choices. There are some things out of our control, but there are things that are based on patterns that we've established in our life, and there's going to be consequences that come from them. And when I was a kid, you know, I wanted to be a firefighter, I wanted to be an astronaut, I wanted to be all that stuff, and now I'm not going to tell you that I don't like where my life is, but there's things that I've engaged in that have led me to where I am. The closest I got to college was standing in a line at a registration desk with a check for tuition. I got about three people from the registration lady and thought, I'm not doing this. And I went out and got a job. Well, and here I am. I've been in construction for a lot of years now. I'm not a lawyer. So if you have need of legal advice, find someone else. (laughs) (laughs) There's a story in the Bible. You're familiar with uh, David, probably, and... uh, He was a guy that the Bible refers to as a man after God's own heart. He started out in a field as a shepherd. And he had big brothers that were, you know, we had great expectations for the big brothers. And uh, Samuel comes to anoint a king. And he goes through all the brothers and said, this isn't the guy that I'm after. Is there anybody else? And they say, yeah, go get your brother David. He's small, he's scrawny. But God had a plan for David, right? So he ends up being anointed as the next king of Israel after Saul. And David ends up protecting his flock, kills some lions, kills some bears with his bare hand, and it's clear that that God is with him, right? And ends up, there's a story of of the king of the day, Saul chasing David down, wants to kill him because he's threatened. Saul had this pattern in his his life of of self-promotion and and who am I and who can I be and me, me, me. And David represented the fall of himself. And so uh, eventually David becomes king, And he gets to this point in his life where things are looking pretty good. I mean, he's pretty much at the top of his game at this point. But I'm going to read you a psalm that I came across that David wrote that struck me a little bit. I just happened to be reading this on a morning devotion. It says in Psalm 51, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, And my sin is always before me. Which is an interesting psalm to write at the top of your game, right? I mean, he's the king of Israel. He's living in a palace. Things are going his way. And yet he writes this psalm saying, there's something wrong here. I've messed up. God forgive me. But if you go back a little further, you kind of find out why this was written. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 18 says, On the seventh day, the child died. That's how the verse starts out. And this was one of David's sons. It was a tragic moment in David's life. And before that, Nathan had come to him and said, hey, God knows what went down. God knows what happened. He goes on to say, David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they thought while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. And David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. So he asked them, is the child dead? Yes, they replied, he is dead. Now, the next thing that David does is, is pretty interesting. It says, David got up from the ground, and after he had washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. So while the child is sick, while the child is suffering, David's in prayer, he's mourning, he's fasting, his attendants are worried about him. And then as soon as the child dies, 
David gets up, cleans himself up, puts some smell him on, and goes into his palace and sits down for a meal, which would be puzzling. So the only thing you can assume is there's more to the story than this, right? If you go back a little further, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 16, there's a story of a battle that uh, David's army was involved in, and his commander, Joab, was sent out to put this city under siege. And he had put Uriah, 2 Samuel 11, he had put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men of the city, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. So David asked the commander of his army to put Uriah at, at the front where the battle was the fiercest, which probably puzzled Job a little bit because Uriah had been a faithful servant of David. And Joab reluctantly says, all right, Uriah, here's where I want you to be. And Uriah ends up dying. If you go back a little further than that, you have to wonder, well, man, why would David do that? 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1 says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. And I think that's the key, that's the start of this whole thing. This says, for some reason the Bible includes that in the springtime when kings go off to war, David stayed at home. When he's supposed to be out doing something, David stayed at home. When the obligation was to go to war with his army, he chose to stay at home. And if you know the story, you know what happens next is David takes a stroll around on his rooftop at night and notices off on the side there's a woman bathing on another rooftop. I, I can only imagine or suspect, and it doesn't say it in the Bible, but my guess is this is not the first time David took this stroll on the rooftop because he was a man after God's own heart and God had told the armies to go and defeat this country and David had stayed at home. So at some point along the way, this seed had been planted in David's head that he latched onto and sent his army out, but he stayed at home in the comfort of his palace, right? And that's where this whole thing went away. That's where... This whole story spirals out of control as when David gives himself over to this one temptation and people end up dying. Now, I want to be careful to say that because David did this or because we do stuff like this, God is not going to take away our children. God is not going to punish us that way. This is the, the story that is written in this portion of the Bible. And we serve a God of grace. We serve a God that loves repentance. And we serve a God that wants to restore us, right? But this is how this story goes. And it starts at this very small point where David takes a second look at this woman on the roof. And I've, I'm compelled to add right here, for those of us who have sons, for those of us who have uh, any reason to uh, relate to this story, there is no time in life to ignore this type of pattern, in our, especially in our young men, in our own lives too. There is no room for the second look in stuff like this. Our sons and daughters walk around with little computers in their hands, and make no mistake, there's an enemy that wants to trap a generation in sexual sin, no doubt about it, and they have such easy access to it, and it starts very small and spirals out of control quickly. I mean, it's a destructive pattern if there ever was one, and it ruins families, it ruins relationships, it ruins thought process, it ruins everything in life, so don't ignore it this pattern in particular. So moving on, I think at the end of this, uh, when David wrote this psalm, he was probably thinking to himself, man, how did I get here? How did I get to the point where I'm writing this psalm? But if you take a look back, it becomes pretty evident that it started when he stayed home from where he was supposed to be. And it starts small and has potential for pretty rapid growth. Uh, there's a story of an airline flight, uh, 1979, a sightseeing flight carrying 257 people left New Zealand for the Antarctic. In the first service, I need to apologize, I, re I said they were going to look at polar bears. Polar bears don't live in the Antarctic. <laughs> Penguins do. They might have been looking for them, but they weren't there. <laughs> so whatever. Fact checkers got me. <laughs> anyway, they're on this flight. It's an airplane. We got those two facts figured out. <laughs> They're headed for the Antarctic, but, and these were experienced pilots, but they didn't know that their flight calculations were off by two degrees, just two degrees. So they're flying over 
to the Antarctic to get over the water. They're looking at penguins and ice shelves and stuff like that and don't realize as they drop down to get a closer view, everybody's looking off to the side, right? But dead ahead of them is this mountain called Mount Erebus, which was a 12,000 foot peak. And so while they're enjoying their time, thinking things are going pretty well, this, this mountain's getting closer and closer. Because they had ended up 28 miles off course from where they thought they would be. And they all, the, the plane crashes into the, the mountain, and 257 people for, plus the pilots all died because of a slight miscalculation. And it speaks to me about the little stuff in life that we're going through, the direction that we're headed And the little stuff that comes in that compromises us and the patterns that form and stuff like that that lead us to a place that when we get there, you think, man, how in the world did I get here? But we only veered slightly off course. And it wasn't a big move, but little moves grow exponentially as we get farther away from the truth, right? I had a a moment when I was a kid that uh, I had this little bird named Poncho. It was a cockatiel. It was about this big. He was a fun bird, a little gray bird. My parents, I asked for a bird for my birthday, and my parents gave me a bird. Later, we had a cat, and then that ended the bird. <laughs> yeah, nature. But one day, the bird used to ride around my shoulder all the time. When I was probably eight years old or something like that, and I would always sit on my shoulder, and, oh, Jeremy and his bird walking all around the house, and that was great. And one day, the bird's wings grew back a little bit, and the bird jumped up on top of my head, and I thought, hey, that's cool. Now the bird's riding around on the top of my head. And my, uh, so that was going on on a Wednesday. We had youth group on Wednesday, or, yeah, youth group on Wednesday night with Royal Rangers, and my, my dad said, hey, Jeremy, put the bird away. We've got to go to church. like, okay. Because that's, as a child, I always obeyed 100%, never argued. <laughs> okay, Dad, that sounds good. <laughs> I put the bird away, and I went to uh, Royal Rangers, and I was sitting through, um, they had a lesson that night. Everybody's quiet, except the row behind me was laughing pretty hard. And I thought, well, there's, this guy's not saying anything funny. What's going on? I turned around, it was my brother. I said, Mark, what are you laughing at? He's like, you got a big piece of poop on the back of your head, brother. <laughs> From the bird. <laughs> <laughs> There's a popular phrase going around that says you can't help a bird from landing on your head, but you can help it from making a nest. And that's the, the idea behind the thought pattern. So I immediately changed my pattern of where the bird would ride on my head because this was not a pleasant experience for me, right? And that's the way we need to treat these things that come into our lives is what are we doing with the thoughts that come into our head? I mean, what's the pattern with thoughts? Are you chewing on them? Are you letting them sit there for a long time? Is the bird building a nest? Is it leaving its mark in your thoughts? Or are you putting them aside? I also, uh, it's pretty important to understand who you are in life, where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are. Um, this week I had a couple midlife crises, crises, which is fun. I'm at that age now. Um, I happened to be taking my daughter to coffee on Saturday and uh, in the parking lot there was this, I think it's a 2014 Shelby GT350 Mustang. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. (laughs) It belongs to a friend of mine, so I walk into the coffee shop and I go, man, come on, why'd you drive that car today? And uh, he's like, hey, you want to take it for a drive? I was like, yes. Yes. And I know this about myself, right? A car like that, I'm not getting into it because I value the economy of it. You know, the mileage is so good in a GT 350 that, I mean, it'd be a wise investment, right? But I did, I sat in there and I I fired it up and sat there and revved the throttle. By the way, when you rev up those cars, the thing that comes out the exhaust is you're going to jail, you're going to jail, you're going to jail, and it gets louder and louder as you rev it more. That was the first one. Then, uh, I, you know, I'm a car guy, right? I love mechanics. I think between Jesus in my life and internal combustion, it's, it's saved me from a lot of trouble, kept me out of a lot of... It's added to some trouble as well, but... I was driving down uh, 50, and there's a used car lot, and there's a shiny black Dodge Challenger. They call it a Hellcat. I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's factory 707 horsepower, which is... You know, I started thinking, well, shoot, man, if I trade my truck in for that, that'd probably pull my trailer. Maybe. 
practically speaking. That one screams even louder. This one's actually 800 horsepower because they modified. That one screams even louder when you rev up the exhaust. But I know enough of myself that I'm not buying that car to be practical. I'm not buying it because I need it to do work. This is just the total lark in my life. This is just something that I feel like I, I want to do. But it's not healthy for me. It's not going to draw my wife closer <laughs> to me. <laughs> in fact, it may have the exact opposite effect. I don't know. <laughs> it's not going to do the things that I need it to do for me. I, there was one point I asked the salesman, I mean, this is a this total confession. I need, it's a moment of weakness for me. I parked my truck next to the car. I was like, well, what, I mean, what would you give me for my truck? <laughs> It's like, no, 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 I'm just kidding. I can't do that. He was thinking maybe straight trade. I was like, ooh. I still have a truck. I, I was able to power through. But you got to know yourself a little bit. You got to know where your strengths and weaknesses are, and you got to establish your patterns based on that. And you can't ignore the fact that I have weaknesses. I have things in my life that are not healthy for me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 starts out by saying, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And the point being, it's easy. There is no shortage of opportunities to form bad patterns, to take the wrong path in life. You can see it everywhere. And it's not hard to find things that are destructive. It's not hard to find things that are going to develop hurt somewhere down the road like high insurance rates and huge gas bills and lots of worn out tires or strife in your family or unhappy marriages. And the opposite is true as well, that good habits and good patterns bring happy marriages, healthy wives, healthy kids, 100%. And the people are looking, you know, we, want, we all want this guarantee in life that if I do this, then I get this. And if I do that, then I get that. And there just flat out aren't very many guarantees in the world. And we're still trying to find the guarantees that will say, yes, if you do this, then you'll be wealthy. If you do this, then you'll be healthy. I don't know how many diets there are in the world that guarantee just do this one thing and you'll feel better about yourself. Right? Cleanses and all this kind of, no doubt, some of that needs to happen. But it's all over the place and people are looking for that kind of thing to have satisfaction in life. And that's the pattern that people go around doing. And there's, there's nothing wrong with it, but sometimes it's a big distraction from what God has for us. I would say that a lot of the times when stuff like this goes on, you end up feeling more stuck than anything because yet another thing didn't work. And another pattern that we've tried that someone said was good, it's like we, we get this box that has a shiny guarantee on it, and so we buy the box. But on the inside is just a piece of garbage. It doesn't do anything for us. But we bought the box. The box said guaranteed. Shouldn't this work? And it doesn't. And so you end up just feeling stuck in some pattern that you can't get out of. And what we want to have is life in Christ. I mean, that's what's preached here from the pulpit almost every week is there's life to be had, right? But I would say that a lot of that is just a result of being committed to certain patterns, and afraid to let them go. And those patterns can a lot of the times become more harmful than helpful. But it's what we know. But I say, and I would suggest, that the God we serve has a much different pattern for us in life. Has much more power than we maybe give him credit for sometimes. And God has great expectations for us. And we need to have great expectations from God. Because he's waiting there for us. You can't move forward if you keep applying this same pattern to the same situation and hoping for a different result. There's some course corrections that are required. The way we do that is Galatians 5, verse 16. It says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. The main point of that is, there's two parts of our life. There's the flesh part, the world part, that wants to go out and buy cars and uh, let the smoke out of the tires, all that kind of stuff. And then there's the spirit side of us that says there's people that need to be reached. There's a life of fulfillment that's in store for you. And then there's the other part that just wants people to laugh 
and at their expense it doesn't matter, or just wants to have fun, and at who has ever expense, financially, relationally, it doesn't matter. And then there's the other part of it that says, no, I have a, I have a point and a purpose for putting you on earth for such a time as this. And it's not to not have fun, it's not to not enjoy life, but there's a point and a purpose for each one of us being here. And it's not by mistake that you're sitting here today. And it's not by mistake that you were born at the time you were born. Because God had a plan, and God has a pattern for your life. And we're not to live by the flesh, but to live by the Spirit. And it's different than what the Spirit wants. And the first pattern to understand, and I'm... I'm, uh, It's interesting to have conversations with people when you talk about religion and stuff. And, uh, you know, the the conversation always seems to naturally go to, am I tipping the scales in my favor? Have I done enough today to make God happy with me? Or have I done enough today that when I go to church, I don't have to ask for prayer? Well, last week I had to ask for prayer, but this week I had a pretty good week. I don't feel like I need prayer. I'm just going to enjoy the service. Well, that, that pattern needs to be stopped. Because the measuring ourselves on, on the height of a yardstick, you know, I had a good week, so I'm here. I had a bad week, so I'm here. The, the measuring stick is laid flat. There's no more height that you can get on there because Jesus has done a work that we couldn't have done. I mean, his death on the cross accomplished what we couldn't do. That's the good news of the gospel. And we've got to quit letting that pattern permeate our thinking. Where I, who am I to witness to somebody? Who am I to pray for somebody because of the things I have done? I mean, that's pervasive thought, even in a lot of the Christian church. Who am I to stand up here and share a message with people? If you knew half the stuff I've done, you would think, yeah, maybe, he sh- maybe he's not the first pick. But that's not the point, is it? That doesn't change the story of Christ. That doesn't change where I'm at as far as my righteousness goes. That Christ has made me right. And I can't do anything about it. <laughs> awesome to know, right? The second one is this. We've got to walk by the Spirit. We've got to put the fleshly desires to the side and form this pattern in our life of, God, what do you have for me? What's next? If you're feeling stuck somewhere, what's next? What do I do now? I guess I get up and go to work. Well, there's a little more to it than that. God, what do you have for me at work? I mean, a lot of the times, uh, the best... The best Times I have with Christ is in the middle of the night, I'll be awake, and I'll go outside, try not to wake anybody up, and just look up for a while, and see the stars, and see the creation of the world that's around me, and marvel at it a little bit, and say, man, what does God have for me? What is he presenting for me to say yes to? And try to make that the pattern of my life, and keep saying yes, because we serve a powerful God. Now, on the other hand, There's this pattern of, do I take a second look at that? Do I take a second look at that that woman walking down the street? Or do I say no and look the other way? Do I cover this lie with another lie? Or do I immediately get the truth in there? Or do I start with the truth? Do I take that thought and do I chew on it? Or do I say no? Second Corinthians says we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Because there's a destructive nature to these thought patterns. There's something inside of them that wants to pull you away and the Spirit wants to pull you towards. Closer to God and further away from sin and closer to God's pur- purpose and patterns. And there's another thing to think about here is, uh, you know, I enjoy my life. I, I really don't feel like I'm uh, falling off a cliff spiritually. I don't feel like my family is unhealthy. I don't feel like I hate my job. In fact, I really enjoy the things that I do. Um, we're not going broke. <laughs> Our vehicles are running fine. So all in all, life's pretty good. But there's this temptation to be complacent in all of that. And maybe start to think, well, this is good enough. I'm, I'm okay with where I am. I'm not doing poorly. But again, that's the pattern of a small God. To think that this is as good as it can possibly get. And there's some, there's some risk involved in that, I get it. To look up, and to look out and say, man, what do you want from me, Lord? There's got to be more than this. Because it's not all that God has for you, I guarantee it. 
it is not all that God has for you. And I don't care who you are. The God we serve is more than able. And in fact, in David's story, after he wrote that 51st Psalm of repentance and regret and remorse and all this stuff, David ends up having another son named Solomon who goes on to do great things for the Lord. And he's completely restored, no matter what happens. And it looks a little bit, it, it does tend to look a little bit crazy in the world's eyes. I had a, a phone conversation with a guy just this week. Saying, Jeremy, how do you keep going? How, I mean, what's your, what motivates you? Because all I see in the world is injustice and stuff. And all I see is evil. And he's worked with people way high up in the internet technology industry. I don't know nothing about it. I don't even know if I'm saying that name right. He's worked with some very wealthy people. And he said, man, most of them are so selfish. Just struggling after the money. Go, hey, where's the good? And I, and I said, man, it's not here. The good is not going to be found in the world. The good is going to be found inside of you when Christ enters your heart. And there's so much more when you latch on to what God has for you. And it starts with these patterns of living. That I'm not here by chance. This is not as good as it gets. This is not the only thing that Christ has in store for me. But I think we kind of forget to dream sometimes because of complacency. And forget to look at what's the possibility. Maybe what could I do with Christ? Is there something that I can do? I guarantee you that there is. And it's not hard, by the way. It's not taking on another job. It's not um, making your schedule even busier than it already is. It's nothing like that. It's Christ working through you to see people the way that he does. And to fix the problems in our own patterns. And to fix things that have gone awry. And to make life better than it is. To experience the real life that Christ has for us. We need to ask these questions. Am I dreaming? Is the pattern of my life complacency? Or am I willing to ask God, flat out, God, there's got to be something more. I'm feeling a little bit stuck where I'm at right now. God, would you help me get out? And what's next? What is the next thing that you have for me, Lord? Is it, it's pretty easy to you know, this day and age to uh, have this publicly suitable God that we serve that uh, is friendly to everybody and not challenging and all that kind of stuff, but that's a mistake. I want to conclude with this, uh, the 23rd Psalm, uh, just the very first part of it says, the Lord is my shepherd. That's one of those things that uh, I think most of Christendom is familiar with. That the Lord is my shepherd, and initially it's just, yeah, the Lord is my shepherd, he guides me. He, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the Lord. Which is true. God has created salvation for us. God has met our needs. I mean, all the promises in the Bible, right, that say God will guide and direct us. But we stop at a certain point. And the breakdown of this verse that is so profound is when it says the Lord at the first part of that. That the Lord, meaning the one who spoke the words and everything we see came into being. The one who allows us to discover all these neat things that we can marvel at and say, look at what we've created, when all the while we're just rearranging facts and figures that were there since the creation of the world. I mean, the God that said spin and the earth spun. The God that said sparkle and the stars sparkle. Heat the earth and the sun became in existence. And then the God that created the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were, which was beautiful paradise, and led the Israelites out of Egypt, part of the Red Sea, that has control over every facet of our existence, that physics does not apply to God. He can manipulate it however he wants. And the God that created a bush that doesn't burn up when Moses went, was called. And Moses said, I, I've got to go see this bush that doesn't burn up. This is not normal. What's the story here? And then ultimately, that sent his son down, who was nailed to a cross, beaten up and bruised and bloody for us, that on the third day was walking around, talking to people again. That is the, the God over death and destruction that defeated Satan. That's the Lord that it's talking about when it says the Lord is my shepherd. And none of that really applies until you get to the second part of the verse where it says is mine. So that God is mine. That's the God who's guiding me. That's the God who's forming patterns in my life. That's the God who's making a testimony for me. And then allow him to shepherd us. 
And we look at life a lot of the times as just the point, the dash on the tombstone between our birthday and our death day. And that's the most important part to the world's eyes. But it doesn't really matter unless we're living for past the point of our death, right? But everything we do now applies to eternity. That's the pattern that we need to make. So I'm going to be down here after this worship song. I just, I want to pray with, with some people. If you're feeling like you're stuck, if you're satisfied, if the complacent thoughts have entered into your head. Because there's a, the challenge today is that that pattern should stop because God has more for you. God has healing. God has restoration. God has a new vision for you. And to let Jesus shepherd you along the way. So we'll, be, we'll have some people down here after the song. But last thing, Greg Laurie is a, you may have heard of him. He's a pastor in California. has a really successful church that emphasis on outreach and a lot of, a lot of people getting saved. He wrote this quote, said, God's plans for you are better than any plans that you have for yourself. So don't be afraid of God's will, even if it's different than your own. Thank you so much for being with us. I hope that God spoke to you. We would love to follow up and care for you any way that we can. So come visit us at gracemontrose.org. Say hello. Let us know what we can do to help you grow in Him. God bless you.